He was flawed. He was a man. He wasn't a saint. He's a hell of a man. The final torchbearer at the Atlanta yeah. Games. How did that come about? 1996 Atlanta Olympics. Dick Ebersole gets all the credit in the world for this. Head of NBC Sports, long history with the Olympics, great sense of how they should be presented. And he suggests to the Atlanta organizers, Muhammad Ali. And at least some of them pushed back and said, you know, he may be a hero in some parts of the country, but down here in the South, he's still a draft dodger. And Dick said, no, you got it wrong. The country has come around on this. This is a, a, a life that's had many chapters. So he convinces them, but no one knows. Dick Enberg and I are hosting the opening ceremony and Dick Ebersole says, I'm not gonna tell you who it is. You will instantly recognize him or her, but I want your reaction to be as spontaneous as the people in the stadium. So there's no way to prepare. I'm thinking, who could it be? You know, Evander Holyfield was the heavyweight champion of the world. He's from Atlanta. Hank Aaron, but he's not really connected to the Olympics. Um, it never occurred to me that it might be Muhammad Ali. And they rehearsed it one time at like three o'clock in the morning. No, like a dozen people on planet Earth knew who it was. And the way they staged it, when Janet Evans, the great swimmer, came up the long staircase to the top, Muhammad literally stepped out of the shadows and into the brightest spotlight, really, in all of global sports. And you, you hear a lot of sounds in an arena or stadium. One you almost never hear is an audible gasp. 60,000 some people, oh my, it took like two or three seconds before it gave way to thunderous applause. And you know, even then, 20 years before his death, he's compromised, he's shaking, the effects of Parkinson's are there. And in that moment, the combination of the dramatic presentation, his charisma and standing, even in that compromised state, it's Muhammad Ali for God's sake, and the reconciliation you got the feeling that in that moment, those who had been doubters or even antagonistic had come around. Here was this guy, once the most nimble and beautiful of athletes. He was a beautiful figure in a brutal sport. He was willing to present himself shaking and trembling, such a contrast to his former self. He was always a vain man. I'm too pretty to be a boxer and look at me, I don't have a scratch on me, etc. And yet he was willing He'd come around in his own life. He was so spiritual. He was willing to present himself to the world that way. That was poignant. That was profound. And I think everybody got it. In their, in their own way, everybody got it. W what about it? it still touches you to this day? I get goosebumps still thinking about it. There's the humanity of it and the arc of his life. I mean, this guy has a profound life beyond his obvious athletic excellence and brilliance and, and how compelling he was to watch. All the issues that, that, cir that swirled around him, uh, what he put on the line, you know, bumper stickers are one thing, tweets are another, even kneeling at a game. He doesn't step forward. He doesn't know if he'll ever fight again. And as it was, he loses more than three years of the prime of his career millions and millions of dollars. He doesn't know if he'll go to jail. You know, if he just stepped forward, he would never have seen combat. It would have been like Joe Lewis. You know, you fight some army exhibitions. You don't have to agree with it to say, wait a minute, this guy put his money where his mouth was. This guy walked the walk. He put it all on the line. You got to respect that. Um, plus, his decency became evident and became a figure of goodwill and, and, and peace and reconciliation, you know, his decency, he was a flawed person. He, and the recent Ken Burns documentary lays that out. He was flawed. He was a man, he wasn't a saint. He was a hell of a man.